A deafening sound suddenly filled the air, as something caused all the walls and floors around to shake violently. The shockwave reverberating seemingly throughout the entire ship, and almost taking the floor from under their feet. James could feel the material flex multiple centimetres, hoping to everything he held dear that it would hold. After the first impact was over, the ship immediately went into full danger mode. Lights turned a bright red, and alarms blaring into their ears. There has been an explosion in the research wing. Please remain calm. The hull has not been breached and no essential systems have been affected. Security is on their way. In the meantime, please evacuate the evacuated area. If there are colleagues in need near you, help them evacuate as well. I repeat. A calm message rang out for the intercoms. James looked around. Shida and himself had managed to stay on their feet during the detonation, but most people around them had not been as fortunate. Luckily, no one seemed seriously injured, and most of them had already started to get back up again. Shida was not looking around, instead opting to listen intently and sniffing the air. That is the fire alarm, she calmly stated, looking down the corridor before them, and it sounded like that was close. Before James could respond, she was already taken off in the direction the sound had come from. Wait! James yelled after her and began to follow. Aren't we supposed to evacuate? You are free to leave if you want to, she shouted back over her shoulder without so much as slowing down. James had no intention of turning around, but he did have trouble keeping up with her. Many frightened crew members were running towards him, away from the supposed danger, making it hard to follow the agile woman who was faster than him anyway. By now the air started to smell of smoke, even to him, and he could even see its source. It was only two lamps over from his own. The massive metal door was bent outward, having been ripped open at the middle where its two parts met, allowing thick, dark smoke to escape the room. Shida had stopped. She turned, seeing him approach, and immediately stated, Something's not right. The computer should be extinguishing that fire by now. James looked at the heavy damage done to the door and suggested, Maybe the system was damaged. The explosion must be massive. Then he looked around the corridor, sadly finding no signage, nor something of the like. He whirled around to Shida and asked, You know the ship better than me. Is there some sort of fire extinguisher nearby? I'll get it. Wait here. Shida confirmed, and took off in the direction they had come from. While she was gone, James carefully moved towards the massive, damaged door, peeking through the hole that had formed. The smoke was mostly confined to the ceiling and upper part of the laboratory, allowing him mostly clear vision inside the room. As he expected, it had been devastated. Parts of shattered furniture and electrical devices, as well as shards of glass littering the floor. The walls were charred and bent out of shape from the sheer force unleashed upon them. The fire raged on the right part of the room, slowly creeping across the floor. What was even burning? The metal? Wasn't that impossible? Suddenly, something caught his eye. Something moved behind a tipped over workbench in the corner furthest from the fire. At first, he thought it was just a dancing shadow cast by the flickering flames. Upon closer inspection, however, its edges were too clear, its movements too fluid and not at all erratically. Someone was slowly rocking themselves in that corner. Could anyone in that room have survived such an explosion? Knowing that it was a terrible idea, James hoisted himself through the hole in the door, charging inside the room, trying to keep his head as far below the smoke as he possibly could. While nearing the figure, and with most of the alarms being blocked out by what remained of the door, he could hear them softly muttering to themselves. No, this isn't what was supposed to happen. It's not possible. This doesn't make any sense at all. Their voice came to his ears, sounding oddly synthetic. Hey, are you alright? Can you walk? We have to get out of here. James shouted over the alarms and the roaring of the ever closer coming flames. He could feel the hot air wafting over him, the heat growing more intense with each passing moment. Maybe it's... No, that's not right at all. But then, how did... The mumbling continued. James stepped closer, now being able to look over the table at the figure. Their body was sleek and black as the void. The only features he could make out being what looked like two large red compound eyes, seemingly eerily glowing in the fire's shine. The body was round and segmented like an insect's pupa, a head in the front more suggested than actually there. With four short appendages coming from the front of the large, lower segment, and six more, way larger ones protruding from the back, looking like gigantic crustacean-like legs. With their forward arms, they were holding their head while rocking themselves back and forth with the large backwards ones, keeping themselves suspended a few centimetres above the ground. 
hoping to snap them out of whatever was happening with them. James reached out to them. Once his hand had made contact with one of the large legs, he realised that he was touching metal. The person, however, seemed to still feel his touch and whirled around, swatting his hand away with another of their large appendages. No, I have to figure it out. This cannot have happened, they yelled frantically. James looked over at the flames, looming menacingly over him and the distressed person. Listen, we don't have time, we have to leave, now, James shouted at them. He thought about whether or not he could just grab them and carry them out. On the other hand, he didn't want to get too closely acquainted with the heavy metal claws on the end of their legs. A yell from behind him ripped him from his thoughts. James! Someone was calling out to him. It was Shida. I'm in here, he yelled back. What? Are you crazy? Shida cried out, her face appearing at the hole in the door only a moment later. Then she told him, Listen, you have to get out of there. Something's not right with that fire. We'll have to blast that entire room, and you don't want to be in there when that happens. Someone's still in here, James yelled back at her. I have to get them out first. What? But how? Shida blurted out before shaking her head and ordering. Anyway, hurry up with it. We can't wait much longer or the damage could actually start afflicting the hull. The alarms were still blaring. The smoke made it hard to breathe and the heat of the fire practically crashed against his face. And in front of him, there was still that muttering. This is impossible. It doesn't make sense. I have to figure it out. James braced himself against the sheer sensory overload around him, taking a deep breath despite the smoke and closing his eyes. As good as he could, he calmed himself down completely. Feeling the adrenaline pump through his veins, he tried to bring himself, at least momentarily, into a state of tranquility. Once his hands and knees had stopped shaking, he opened his eyes back up again and slowly stepped over the table, placing himself right in front of the small figure and reaching his open hand out, placing it right within their vision. Slowly, the figure followed his arm with their vision until they looked up to his face. Despite the rational part of his brain telling him not to, he gave them an honest, gentle smile. Then he gently but firmly said, We'll figure it out, but for now, you'll have to take my hand, alright? If we don't make it out of here, we'll never figure it out, so we have to leave. Just take my hand. He did not know if their red eyes could actually see him, as they gave no indication of their focus, but they say firmly aimed at his face for a few moments. You have very sharp teeth, they suddenly stated, the synthetic voice ringing out from them, seemingly without a source. Then they softly reached out, too, grabbing his hand with the hands of their short arms, allowing him to pull them out of the corner and over the table. Their metal legs scuttled quickly along the floor as he pulled them along the room and effortlessly lifted them through the hole in the door. After they were through, Shida quickly helped James slip out of the room himself, pulling him through the crack. Right as he was out, a security team that had apparently been at the ready quickly jammed a large hose attached to some big machine into the hole and blasted something inside that James could not see from his position. By now, the ship's ventilation had begun clearing the smoke out of the corridor so James could take some deep, clear breaths as he collapsed onto his back in front of the destroyed laboratory. Almost in an instant, Shida stood over him. What were you thinking? I don't care how hardy you are, you could have easily died in there. She yelled down at him. Yeah, I know. That was too close even for me, James answered, breathing heavily and coughing every few words. But at least we got everyone out safely. Shida looked down at him, disapprovingly, but did not further lay into him for the moment, instead looking around, saying, Speaking of which, who exactly did you get out of there? And more importantly, where did they go? James propped himself up, looking around. He couldn't find the small black figure among the people in the hallway, but without any people walking about, he could see much further along the corridor than usual, just picking out the small figure sitting far down the empty hall. He pointed in the direction. Shida followed his direction, squinting, while trying to see what he meant, but apparently coming up short. James began to struggle to his feet, Shida quickly rushing over to help him. Thank you, he said sincerely. Come, we should talk to them. And he began making his way, towards the cowering form. Once they had come a good bit closer, Shida began to also make them out at their destination, looking very unsure of what she was seeing. James too did not know who or even what they were dealing with. The small person, only about the size of a toddler not counting their giant backside legs, 
and entirely either clad in or made of a jet black metal, sat in the middle of the hallway, the floor of which had been replaced by a giant window, the very same where James and Sheeta had first met only a few days prior. They suspended themselves a metre above the ground on their long legs, gazing downwards into the void with their large red eyes, while folding their shorter forward arms and legs. Sheeta and James shot each other a glance before stepping onto the window themselves. James slowly sat next to them, his lungs still aching from the strain, signalling for Sheeta to do the same. She obliged with a shrug, sinking down right next to him. For some time, they simply gazed down into the void together with their new acquaintance. Suddenly, the strange, machine-like voice rang out next to him, calmly stating, You can look at it too. It helps me calm down. Most people don't like looking at it. They say it unnerves them. You mean space? It is quite mesmerizing, isn't it? James answered calmly before looking over at them, studying their matte surface. Sheeta was looking over his shoulder, seemingly entrapped by the strange appearance of the person sitting with them, while also appearing more than unnerved. Finally, they were taking their eyes off the window and looking back at James instead. I think I am supposed to thank you for helping me, is that right? They asked, the metal shell acting as their face staying completely unmoving. James was a bit taken aback. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to, he answered abashed, laughing awkwardly. Usually, you would thank people for things that you are thankful for. Shida gave him a perplexed side glance, seemingly questioning both of their sanity. The metal body shifted a bit, possibly changing the angle at which they were viewing his face. It remained in that position, silently, for a few moments. Thank you for staying for me, they said, finally breaking the silence. You are welcome, James replied brightly, even though their wording did confuse him a bit. You probably wouldn't have been able to keep him from doing it even if you tried, Sheeta remarked from behind him, looking at him impishly. You are right, I could not, they replied cluelessly, although I did not try very hard. Sheeta's playful expression disappeared and made way for one of disbelief. Wait, did you seriously... She started, but James hastily held her back. He quickly cut in. It really wasn't any trouble, don't worry. Letting out a big, fake laugh in the process. Sheeda looked annoyed at his behaviour, and was apparently about to reprimand him, but the other person was faster. Do you have metal in your teeth? They investigated excitedly, the pitch of their voice rising. They lifted themselves closer to James's face, apparently trying to get more of a clear view into his mouth, causing him to stumble back with their metal visage quickly approaching his face. What? He blurted out while being forced further back by their advancements in his direction. Hey, what are you doing? Shida yelled, agitated, trying to somehow get them to stop, but failing to find an angle in which she could dodge all six of the crawling metal legs. Finally, having overcome his first moment of shock, James held up both hands, trying to wordlessly establish a distance he would be comfortable with, keeping them in place while facing back a bit more with his legs and sitting upright again. Then, deciding to humour them, he opened his mouth once more, but keeping his hands up. They seemed to intensely study the insides of his jaws, while keeping the distance outlined by his hands. Behind them, Shida, who still seemed a bit unsettled by their sudden action, crept up, seemingly trying to find out what they were looking for, before shooting James a questioning glance to which he could only shrug. Yes, I'm sure of it. Why is it there? What function does it serve? Were you upset when it was put there? You have to tell me. They started barraging him with questions. Guessing that he would be safe now, James closed his mouth up again, trying to process everything they had just said. Metal in his teeth. Well, technically, consisting mostly of calcium, his teeth actually were metal, but he doubted that that was what they meant. But what do they mean? In a sudden epiphany, he asked, Wait, do you mean my feelings? They piped up. So, they are called fillings. What are they filling? Are they wounds? Did you get attacked and the holes had to be filled up again? Is that a usual practice where you are from, or was it an experiment? James shook his head for a moment, trying to order his thoughts against their onslaught, lifting one finger and stating, Okay, just give me one second to breathe. True to his word, he took a deep breath, in and out. Then he decided to work down the questions he still remembered one by one. 
Okay, he began. First, yes, they are called fillings, and their function is to fill holes left in my teeth. Technically, they are wounds, but not really in the traditional sense, and I was not attacked either. Among my people, holes in our teeth happen if we don't take good care of them due to the bacteria living in our mouths being quite corrosive, and since I was pretty dumb as a kid, I had to get quite a few of them. As you can probably guess from that, it is a pretty standard practice where I am from. He then paused for a moment, trying to think if he had forgot anything, while well, they kept intently looking at his face, apparently clinging onto his every word. He could have sworn that he could see a glimmer, even in their literally lifeless eyes. Then it came back to him and he quickly added, And about whether or not I was upset when they put them in, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, I wasn't too thrilled at the time, but I wouldn't say that I was really upset, or if I was, I definitely forgot about it. It was Shida who spoke up next. Looking at him with a disturbed expression, she said, Wait, so you just replace parts of your body with metal if they aren't working anymore? A shudder seemed to run through her whole body as she pressed out the sentence. James was not sure he could see the problem. Well, yeah, he said. What else are we supposed to do, just leave them broken? That wouldn't really fly with humans. Shida shuddered once more, seemingly having to cope with that for a moment. The new acquaintance, however, seemed to have gained a very different effect from this new information. Are you saying that your people use these fillings on other parts of their body as well? They asked, the pitch of their voice rising ever higher as they spoke. Well, no, not fillings, James answered, feeling a bit awkward at their excitement. They are pretty much exclusive to our teeth, but we have other stuff for other body parts, like plates for our heads, or screws for our bones. He thought a bit what other examples he could think of, finally finishing with, and if we lose an arm or something, we can even get a mechanical one. The reactions at this statement could not have been more different. Shida looked like she was about ready to throw up in the mere thought of letting a metal arm get anywhere near her body. While James could feel the excitement of his new friend radiate out of their robotic shell, even without any body language to cue him in. Deciding he could not let such a golden opportunity go to waste, he decided to lay it on a bit thicker, continuing with, To be honest, most humans would be lying if they said they hadn't at least once thought about getting a robotic arm or leg. Okay, stop. I get it. Sheeta said strictly, lifting one up to shut him up, while violently shaking her head, presumably to get some image out of her mind. Fine, I'll stop. James laughed, waving one hand gasolatorily. But honestly, I don't get why you're being so weird about this. Actually, you are the one being weird. Her reaction is perfectly normal, the synthetic voice stated, with what James could swear was a resigned undertone. James was confused by that, and he looked over at them and Shida investigatively. Of course you are the one being weird. I mean, did you listen to yourself? Shida said defensively, sitting back and folding her arms. Just replacing part of your body with some machine, something unnatural, it's... It's just not right. That is the general stance on things, yes, the mechanical voice stated carefully. But, if it is any consolation to you, I think your people are great for being so reasonable with their technology. James smiled at that. Thank you, I don't need any consolation, but I appreciate the thought, he said calmly. Shida scoffed at that, mumbling. Well, your people are weird anyway. Relaxing her posture, she sheepishly exposed one of her large fangs towards him. James nodded back at her in silent understanding. Then she turned towards the metal body of their new friend and stated, We should get back to the matter at hand. Mainly, what caused that giant explosion? James also looked over at them, remembering their distress at what he guessed was that exact question. It is impossible, they simply stated coldly. I am certain... Nothing contained within my work could have caused this phenomenon. There is no mistake in it. It cannot have happened. And yet it did. Their unmoving shell allowed no reading of their emotional state. Sheeta looked very doubtful of their claim. James could understand that. After all, they both saw the extent of the damage caused. Well, maybe we can figure it out together. What were you working on? Um, James began, suddenly realising he hadn't even asked their name yet. Completely ignoring his implied inquiry, they answered. I had just started an experiment, 
testing a new system I am planning to integrate in some of my drones, allowing them to purify and refine materials directly on the surface of the location of harvest, using a collective of extremely heat-resistant alloys in conjunction with a new and extremely energy-efficient heating unit I specifically designed for this project, which, in the finished project, will of course be connect with a cluster of photo and radiovolic panels, continually saving radiating energy during their voyage through the vacuum, but was in the experiment itself connected to an external power source. However, the development is still in its early stages, and the power output by the prototype was nowhere near enough to cause a shockwave of this magnitude, that is ignoring the fact that there is no way it could explode to begin with, because there was no part within the system where pressure could even build up, and also no aggressively reacting components, meaning that… James's ears were buzzing as he tried to keep track of every detail they were laying upon them, while Shida, on the other hand, just looked lost. What you're saying is, it couldn't have been just some random mechanical failure, right? Shida interrupted them in their tension rubbing her forehead and apparently trying to concentrate on something that wasn't the conversation at hand. Impossible. Machines don't work like that. There is nothing random about them. Every failure that does happen can always reasonably be traced down to an understandable source, they responded agitatedly. But nothing in the machine I was testing could have caused something even close to such an effect. Seeking support, both of them looked over to James, who honestly was completely lost as well. Don't look at me, he said defensively. My expertise is earth biology, not robotics. I am so bad with electronics that I would have probably managed to blow the thing up somehow. She decided that defeatedly, finally conceding. Well, it's not that important right now. A thorough investigation will surely clear everything up. Like you said, there should be a reasonable explanation for the whole thing. The mechanical legs of the inventor suddenly came to life, quickly propelling their body towards Sheeta their face coming to a hold mere inches away from Shida's, making her flinch. Oh, but it is important, they blurted out, the mechanical voice turning low and serious. If we cannot figure out how the impossible suddenly became possible, anything could happen at any time, meaning nothing would be safe anymore. Shida quickly pushed them away from her face with one hand, while scurrying backwards, not at all amused by their erratic behaviour. I told you it would be investigated, no need to get all screwy, she said, standing up and dusting herself off a few meters away from the mechanic. James now also stood up, looking back and forth between the two of them, hoping things wouldn't escalate any further as they glared at each other. Luckily, he did not have to wait for long, because shortly after, a group of the ship's security team had arrived and asked to accompany them to the security wing, where they would be able to give their testimonies as to what had transpired. In the following weeks, the incident became the number one conversation topic of the ship, and where Sheeda and James had been a curiosity at most, now they had pretty much become famous overnight. Not having the fact that they were regularly called back into interrogation by the security team to endlessly repeat their testimonies, which never amounted to anything, seeing that they had really just reacted to things happening around them without any knowledge of what was happening and how or why. Even worse than them, however, had it the inventor, who James had come to call Curie, shortened from Curiosity, named after the old tummy Mars rover he had once seen in the museum. After they had continually denied his request of knowing their name, stating that they didn't like it very much, he had suggested the nickname, and after he explained his meaning and origin, they accepted gleefully. They had taken the brunt of the attention, much to their dismay. It was, of course, understandable in the way, that people would be curious as to what happened that had an entire laboratory destroyed and almost damaged the ship. It was also not unreasonable to first look for answers with the person who was present during the incident and had worked in said laboratory. What however was not reasonable was to continually pester them after they had already made their statement, showed their work and had continually shown how uncomfortable it had made them to be constantly asked about it. Apparently, Many people seemed to think that they would somehow gain something from sabotaging specifically their own work and solely endangering their own life. Not helping with people's trust seemed to be their specific situation concerning their anatomy, nor the fact that they mostly tried to keep to themselves and their work. Sadly, overall, the investigation had come up short concerning answers. The laboratory had been sealed up from everyone except the security team, and apparently the source of the explosion could not be conclusively determined. What had been determined was that the strange properties of the fire easily burning through metal had been caused by a strong chemical mixture, 
which contained a highly corrosive substance, able to effectively solve metal, as well as some fluid containing a high quantity of loosely bound oxygen. A mixture which Curie had not been working with, especially since it would be especially dangerous for them. Neither the mixture nor its components had been reported missing in any of the facilities working on, or with such things either, meaning they could not have been stolen. Yet, somehow, these simple facts did not seem to lift the suspicions of some, if not most, crew members off of Curie, which never ceased to annoy Shida, even though she wasn't too fond of the inventor herself. She had just finished an especially tiresome shift, during which she had been repeatedly chewed out by Odi Nalzam, who had been getting increasingly agitated by her, not caring about being chewed out for some dumb reason like not looking attentive enough. How was that a point of critique anyway? She was plenty attentive. It was just that a single, simple task could not as easily consume her entire attention as it could that of some other crew members. The eagerness that she had to quickly perfect her task had very soon been drowned out by sheer mundaneness. So, annoyed and quietly cursing the day Nalsam had become her supervisor, and absolutely ready to vent her frustration at anyone either willing to listen or unlucky enough to flip her switch, she was on her way towards the research wing and James's lab, where she had, to her own surprise, been spending a majority of her free time lately. This was not in small amount caused by it being one of the few places that wasn't her room, where she could have a moment to herself without being constantly gawked at. Especially since James had by now realised that not everyone was a pack animal, and thus he had learned to give her space if needed, allowing her to just doze off or otherwise do her own thing, just kind of hanging out in his laboratory. On her way, she realised, when she had thought the constant looks of their crew members had been annoying before, she wasn't giving them enough credit as to how irritating they truly could be. Nearly every single person she walked past stopped to look after her or whisper something to their nearest colleague. She bit her tongue, forcing herself to ignore it. Finally, she stood in front of the by now so familiar gate. Stopping just short of just letting herself in, she thought better of it and loudly knocked on the door. Her ears fluttered a bit as the door did not immediately open like was usually the case. She wondered if, maybe, it would be one of the rare times James actually wasn't awake and at work when she arrived here. Sometimes she had to wonder if he slept at all or ever did anything but work when she wasn't around, even though she was pretty sure he once told her that his people usually slept for almost entire days at a time. While well, she was still thinking about when James found the time to sleep, the loud hissing of the door as it suddenly opened made her jump. The metal gate obeyed way and gave her insight into the big white room, and also at the red, shiny eyes of Curie looking back at her. James, on the other hand, was nowhere in sight. Hello, Curie greeted, currently standing at their full height, being almost at eye level with Shida, and blocking the way inside the laboratory with their long, spindly legs. Oh, you are here, Shida said back, peeking past Curie to see if James was anywhere in the room she could not currently see. Would you let me come in? James isn't here, Curie stated monotonously, not budging from their position. I can see that, Shida replied, crossing her arms, annoyed at the non-answer. Where is he anyway? He had an arrangement to meet someone for what he calls dinner, Curie stated, once more without changing their tone at all. So, he sometimes did do stuff, at least that was answered. Most of the time the two of them would go eat together, but it was good to know he was at least eating when she wasn't around. Tilting her head and squinting at the unmoving face of Curie's metal body, she once more asked, So, will you let me in now? Curie didn't move. I am not sure how comfortable James would be with you entering his laboratory while he is absent, they said. Shida tapped her foot on the ground, trying to contain her frustration. Well, he's never had a problem with me entering before, she responded with a forced calmness in her voice. Curie slightly shifted their weight around as they replied. That is true, but that was always with James there. Shida could feel her tail start to swing agitatedly and started gripping her arm a little tighter, feeling her fingers start to pinch her skin. He's also never had a problem with leaving while I was in his lab, she stated very slowly, so that she could force herself not to start yelling at the seemingly daft mechanic. Despite, you asked when there despite him not being here, so I don't quite see your point. Curie shifted further around, 
by now swinging left to right in midair, but still not moving aside. James has let me in, they retorted quickly, as if to defend themselves. And usually, James would have let you in too, before he left. So close. They were so close to getting it. By now, seeing as James wasn't even there, Sheeta could just as well have gone to her cabin instead, or she could be doing literally anything else with her time. But right now, for her, it was about the principal. That's right. He usually just lets me in and then forgets I'm even there, so he clearly doesn't care if I'm in his lab. She bluffed at Curie, not quite able to hide the irritation in her voice anymore. Maybe, Curie's mechanical voice quietly muttered, but I really don't want James to be mad at me in case he doesn't want you to come in here today. Was that really what they were worried about? They didn't seem to care nearly as much about her getting mad at them. Well, if that is your problem, Sheeta said, deciding to try a new anger with them, her anger now subsiding a bit at her new idea. Should he come back and doesn't want me in there, we can just say that I forced you to let me enter. That way he would only be mad at me and you would be completely innocent. But that would be a lie, Curie stated unsurely, stopping her swaying and standing frozen in place. With her anger slowly turning into a mischievous smile, Sheeta took a step back, tensed her legs, and sweetly cooed. No, not if I do this. And with that, she quickly leaped straight over Curie's legs, easily clearing almost twice her own height in both height and length with one bounce. Curie's surprise reaction came too late, only managing to block Sheeta's slipstream with the two legs they raised into the air, while Sheeta landed safely on all fours a few steps behind them, smiling very content with herself. Curie quickly whirled around, watching Sheeta get back up again and stretching while the door closed behind them. See? Now you have nothing to worry about, Sheeta murmured mellowly and yawned, while strutting around the room looking for a good place to rest. Curie hastily scurried after her, quietly stammering. No, you shouldn't do that. What if James doesn't want you in here? He's going to get mad. Seeing that only half of the workspace was currently in use, Sheeta had decided to make the other half her napping spot for now, elegantly hopping onto the countertop and sprawling herself out on the white surface. Dismissing their worries, Sheeta asked them, Why don't you just call him and ask whether or not he is okay with me being in here? I can't, Curie answered, still nervous, and pointed towards one of the countertops where James's assistant once more laid around uselessly. Sheeta sighed, as it seemed to be a habit of his to be a complete chore to get a hold of. I told you, she said confidently anyway, her anger having dissipated after her victory. He won't care. And if he does, he's going to be mad at me, not you. I'm a big girl. I can handle it. And then she turned onto her side, facing Curie, supporting her head on her hand and smiling smugly while lightly swaying her tail. Or are you going to throw me out? She cooed, almost challenging them to try and do so. I will not, Curie stated with a hint of annoyance in their synthetic voice. It seems reason can't keep you from being here, so neither can I. Just tell James the truth in case he comes back and does want you out of his laboratory. Will do, Sheeta yawned, turning to her other side and curling up, while Curie walked over to the other half of the workspace. For some time she just laid there, dozing off a bit with the mechanical clacking of Curie's movement and from whatever she was doing soothing her ears. But, while she had worked hard for this nap, the countertop was hard, cold, and overall pretty uncomfortable, and... After the effort it had taken to get there, she was not nearly as tired as she had been anymore. For a short while, she rolled and turned, shifting her weight to try and get comfortable before finally giving up and deciding that she was bored. Her rear slightly twitched as her attention was once more pulled towards the mechanical sounds coming from just a few meters beside her. She put her head up, looking over at Curie, whose foremost legs had somehow sprouted multiple smaller appendages, both of them now fiddling with three tools each, taking apart some box-shaped device with a plastic outer shell. On all fours, Shida slowly creeped over towards them, nosily eyeing the inventor's particular handiwork. She was impressed at the precision of the many tiny arms coming out of their big legs, the actions of many of which she couldn't even keep track of most of the time. Neither did she know the function of any of the tangled insides of the machine, which Curie seemingly effortlessly navigated. Creeping still a bit closer and trying to sound as innocent as she could, Shida asked, 
So, what are you doing in here anyway? I am working, Curie stated coldly, without otherwise acknowledging Sheeta's presence. And what are you working on? Sheeta pried further, while leaning closer to try and make out what each of the little mechanical claws was doing. She had been expecting a sigh or something similar, but Curie just answered in a very matter-of-fact way. With my laboratory destroyed and my work set back for months, as well as temporarily defunct, I have decided that I will spend my time studying these examples of Earth technology, with James's permission of course. It is fascinating really, the human's approach appears to be minimalistic at every angle, or we seem to find the lowest common denominator between different parts and functions, allowing their parts to be nearly universal, allowing for quick assembly of new devices with different functions with only minimal work on developing new parts. Of course, that takes away from the overall efficiency a bit, but it allows for so much flexibility that on a large scale, it probably makes up for it. Shida tilted her head at that. You know, you don't seem too upset for someone whose work and lab have just been destroyed a short while ago, she reckoned, not looking at their metallic replica of her face. In research, setbacks are only natural. It would be silly to be upset over something that is unavoidable, Curie responded, swapping some of the tools they were using and removing some sort of circuit from the box. She thought about that for a moment. Well, that's one way to look at it, I guess, she replied, swinging her legs around under her to now sitting down, right next to where Curie was working. But what happened wasn't unavoidable, right? She further inquired, crossing her legs and leaning down on the top one. You said it should not have happened at all. At that, Curie stopped their complicated work for the first time. I could not have avoided it. All my checks were without find, and I had no reason to suspect anything was not like I had planned it. They answered slowly, their small forward hands starting to fidget with each other. This was getting interesting. So you are saying you couldn't have avoided it, but it wasn't unavoidable, was it? She had suspected inquisitively, leaning more towards the inventor. Are you interrogating me, officer? Curie suddenly asked, finally looking up at her. Sheeda snorted. Interrogating you? I'm a pilot, not a guard. What would I be interrogating you for, anyway? For as I know, you have already been cleared of all suspicion. Well, in the eyes of the law, at least, she avowed amusedly. Then you are really interested in what I think, as a person? Curie asked, suddenly lowering their voice in both tone and volume, and sounding much more serious. Yeah, sure, why not, she replied, shrugging. And you have no obligation as an officer to share what I would tell you with your superiors, Curie further inquired, now also leaning a bit closer towards her. Sheeda thought about that to a moment, picking at her fangs with one of her claws while pondering it. Not as long as it doesn't directly endanger anyone or isn't strictly illegal, and that is assuming I would care to do so in the first place, she finally explained. Curie's metal heart stayed completely still for a moment, as they were most likely thinking about what exactly Sheeta's words would mean for whatever they may or may not wanted to tell her. It took a while, until they had seemingly reached their conclusion. Lifting their face and shifting their body to directly face Sheeta, they said, Then, I believe you could be the right person to talk to. Will you listen to what I have to say? <laughs>